Matt Buckthorpe, welcome to the Pace Performance Podcast. Thank you for giving up some of your morning. Hi, Rob. Thanks so much for the invitation. Yeah, my pleasure. No, thank you. Thank you for coming on. We've had lots of, well, not lots, but quite a bit of content recently around around ACL. We obviously know the, the burden that it puts on um, professional clubs, organizations, down to weekend warriors. So I'm really excited to get you on and, and dive into the various different stages, um, some of the movement um, quality stuff. But before we do dive into that, would you mind just giving us a bit of a, an intro to you? What yeah, you're doing now, yeah. what you've been doing previously? Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. Um, so yeah, currently I'm a senior lecturer at St. Mary's University. Um, so it's kind of a hybrid role between strength and conditioning science and physiology. Uh, now just gone part time, and I also consult to Isokinetic Medical Group, um, sort of based more around sort of research and education of their of their group, and then so, sort of helping them on their service innovation as well. Uh, so I've been, yeah, I guess linked with Isokinetic for 10, 11 years. I was originally a rehab specialist in their London clinic, so sort of five or six years there, and yeah, been consulting to their education and research department for the last five or six years as well. Um, yeah, background, sport and exercise scientist, um, S&C coach principally. I was a failed athlete, which we all like to, to you know, to go that way. Um, yeah, I always wanted to go into coaching. And sort of during my internships in, in football clubs, I got very interested in end stage rehab on field, on field rehab in particular. So I was, yeah, spent a bit of time at Fulham, it was an excellent on field rehab coach there. Um, I'm sure you won't mind me saying, Sean Reed, who really got me massively interested in that area. And yeah, and then an opportunity came up at Isokinetic Medical Group sort of 11, 11 years ago, and I really wanted to learn more about sports medicine. And I had a real passion for end-stage rehab, injury prevention. I just wanted to upskill a lot in, in sports medicine. So yeah, I joined Isokinetic about yeah 11 years ago and been very focused since then around rehab return to play and particularly ACL injuries, which is my main area of research. Uh, prior to all of that, I did a, a PhD at Loughborough around neuromuscular function, neural control. So I've, a lot of my stuff I come at from a, a neural sort of neuromuscular um, area as well. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my background. Just from a personal perspective, my and my interest in obviously understanding more about you and what you do, I saw Kinetic, obviously they've got the clinics, they've got the conference, what else is going on, like different arms of the, the business? Yeah, so, yeah, Italian company. Um, so they've got seven clinics out in Italy and they've got one in London. Um, so London Clinic's been there, yeah, since I was there, 2012. And they also have an education and research department where the conference kind of fits. And I think a lot of people either, yeah, saw them as clinics or saw them as, as a conference producer. Um They've kind of done the conference for 30 or so years now, so it's always closely linked to their to their clinics. Um, yeah, they're kind of expanding. They've got a virtual clinic as well. But, yeah, most of their focus is their private practice, um, orthopedic sports medicine clinic. They treat a range of patients from the general population through to elite, and elite sporting athletes. Their, I guess, main clinic is Bologna. And yeah, Bologna is where the education and research department sits. And so they host the largest football medicine conference. They're a FIFA medical center of excellence. They've got quite a strong link with FIFA. And yeah, I guess the uniqueness probably is that education and research department. So they do actually do research. Um, we've published a good body of research, probably 50 papers over the last five years or so, which is quite good for a very small family um, family company and yeah they're not a university so it's it's not about you know doing well in in the league tables it's yeah obviously trying to answer those questions so that's kind of what attracted me personally was they've got a really good conference they do research and they're also working with 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 a lot of high profile professional athletes as well nice perfect i was been interested in that obviously i know the conference on the clinics but yeah. pretty know the background to it yeah. and kind of what else did well a lot of people and they thought they just yeah, hosted hosted conferences yeah which is always just, a bit you don't you want to yeah link it back into what you do day to day of course so right let's let's dive into the the acl side of things and like i said and like you mentioned in the pre the email that you, you sent to me we've had quite a lot of info when it comes to acls and i think pretty now more than ever than if you'd agree that the spotlight is firmly on acls but would you mind just giving us a bit of a brief outline of the the kind of the stages, um, even pre-op, and then 
early stage, which you've done some nice work in recently, mid stage, late stage, and then we'll dive into each of them individually. Yeah, 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 sure. So, yeah, obviously, really from the point of injury. So, fundamentally, if if you do want to learn about your ACLs, then do have a deep dive into the injury mechanism stuff because that understanding that injury is is pretty key. But yeah, someone gets injured, rupture their ACL. Um, professional athlete would typically have surgery pretty soon. Uh, so most professional athletes will generally have surgery within the first sort of seven to ten days. Uh, but the key thing is is that the knee is is quiet. There's not you know there isn't a restriction in range of motion. There is not a huge amount of swelling, and there is good quad recruitment, quad strength. Um, in that knee but if you do it quite soon you're not going to get a lot of muscle atrophy so hopefully you'll go into that that pretty well um but yeah pre-op pre-op is varies across lots of different people in that if you're a professional athlete and you, you're going in surgery really quick that pre-op period is really really short and um, you will get people who do delay the acl reconstruction and there's a lot of people pushing for delay in that acl reconstruction um to identify what's called copers versus non-copers so there is a large proportion of people that can potentially cope without having an acl and they can get back to a range of sporting tasks including playing football so there are a few case studies out there that professional players have got back haven't had surgery got back you know within two months and they're back playing for a good couple of years um but the process really depends on the the person and um, the stage of their career their age if you're dealing with a 21 year old you know elite level footballer that's going to be very different to a 35 year old and um, professional player and so i guess yeah designing designing the overall process first start with the end in mind so i do like that reverse engineering concepts where you you look at where you need to get to and then you, you work your way back but fundamentally it's we've got to try and get players back to play as quick as possible and um, so i do believe in doing it as fast as you can but making sure that they they go back at the, the necessary performance level and they've got a low risk of injury. Now, that's really hard to do quickly. So, yeah, get them back as fast as you can, but it is going to take probably on average sort of six to eight months for a professional player and then probably looking around 12 months for a recreational athlete. Um, in terms of the process, yeah, you've got pre-op um, stage, which can be either very short or can be six to 12 weeks preparation. Um, then you go into early, mid, late and then the return to sport continuum. Um, so isokinetic and the way I used to work was always a phased approach, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, phase five. But I, I kind of never really got that because for me, phase three could mean anything because you could have six phases or five phases or four phases. So um, I kind of have gone with the early, mid, late because it gives a bit of time um, context to it. So early stage basically is immediately post-op for kind of the first four to eight weeks of rehab. And really what you're trying to do there is overcome surgery, um, recover activities of daily living. And I guess the key milestone is, can you get patients off the crutches, walking without crutches with good, with good sufficient gait? And can they yeah, go about their normal lives? Because um, prior to that point, there's a certain dependency on um, supporting um, support from individuals and that's what I got from this early stage paper some really great input from Ross Wadey around the social support structures that are in place for athletes um because they're really they are dependent on other people for you know getting around transport cooking dinners and so it's kind of the end of that early stage sort of means that people can be a bit more independent they're off the crutches they can do normal activities of daily living the knees quiet there's not a huge amount of pain not a huge amount of swelling um, so once you go from early, you're into the mid stage, that is a little bit longer. Um, the reason it's a longer stage is because one of the hardest things to do after ACL reconstruction is to recover quad strength. And you can't transition into late stage rehab until you've got sufficient knee extensor, so quadricep muscle strength. Um, and so the length of the stage will vary. And it really depends on what's the quad weakness going into the stage. So some people will enter with a 30% deficit versus the other side. Other people will enter with a 60% deficit. And so on average, it might take 2% a week. You might have a 2% improvement in strength for each week. So if you're starting at 30%, it's, it's a lot easier to get back to you know, the 20% that you need to go into late stage. So I, I have a, a limb symmetry index of, of 80% to go into to the, to the late stage. So if you need to recover 40%, that's going to take you a long amount of time. 
at two percent a week so it's a good period of time there um but yeah mid-stage rehab really is the main focus is recovering quad strength making sure the knee's still nice and nice and quiet good range of motion trying to get back to running on a treadmill um and sufficiently pe preparing our athletes to go into the late stage so that's sufficient physical fitness good movement patterns overcoming major muscle imbalances um, so that when they do enter late stage rehab, where there's a lot more jumping landing, they've got the necessary physical capacity to be able to tolerate that. Um, late stage rehab is about really transitioning an athlete from an 80% limb symmetry index of the quads. They probably can run on a treadmill, but they can't do any other movement type tasks, so they're not cutting, they're not decelerating. Um, it's taking them from the ability to run in a straight line to being able to do high intensity pre-planned change of direction drills on the field. So it's 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 really recovering the physical capacities to perform most sporting movements. Um, but those sporting movements are sort of pre-planned, so changing direction, 180 cuts, 90 degree cuts, um, accelerating, obviously running at high speeds, and doing all of that with sufficient movement quality and not having those imbalances in place. And then yeah, return to sport training is where the the shift really focuses on whatever sport you're doing. So if it's football, it's it's on field rehab that's football focused, restoring their technical drills, um, moving towards like reactive movements, training them onto fatigue, all of those sports specific contextual factors, and um, and yeah, readying them for return to training. So on field rehab is a is that bridge to from the in clinic to to the team training. Then you go from team training to um, gradual restoration back to competitive match play and then you, you're gradually feeding them back into their, their return to performance as well so i guess that's kind of the overall thing is yeah early mid late return to sport continuum um there are some key objectives that allow you to progress along the way i like to use criterion based rehab so i have set criteria at each stage to help you transition across um and then probably a key part there is is recognizing the different services that's available so obviously you've got your your, your physio based rehab you'll have your your reconditioning based snc stuff um you'll have your hydrotherapy which i'm a huge fan of in acl rehab but a lot of people don't have a pool so it's not spoke about as much um and then yeah this kind of movement environment and on-field rehab and it's balancing all of those different environments to maximize them and then just gradually taking that athlete through from the point of injury back to back to return to play and hopefully when you make that decision on return to play they're they're at the right performance level they can pass return to sport criteria but they're also pretty safe at going back and there's a big difference between return to play and re-injury risk a lot of the factors that help us get back to play don't protect us from an injury so it's a sort of balance in all of those bits as well um but yeah so i won't talk for a whole hour hopefully no 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 you're all good you're all good i can just let you go just you let know. you go Matt. yeah no i think we'll we'll dive into that yeah. that late stage that moving from the pre-plan to the complex a little bit later on i'm really interested to get that because the majority of the audience for the podcast as we know is is snc coaches predominantly uh, sorry those that are looking after that that super late stage i think it'd be most relevant to them but i'd like to have a little chat around the, the dimensions of the early stage and, and your recent paper at the six dimensions of that, that early stage acl rehab would you mind just expanding on that a little yeah. bit and just yeah, yeah, so we can understand that phase and then, yeah. then we'll jump to the jump to the yeah, end definitely. so yeah obviously i've kind of highlighted six six dimensions now this is i guess new in that a lot of discussions whether the the co-authors on the paper particularly lee harrington around this um sort of highlighting those those dimensions so a lot of the time the early stage is very much focused on the joint um and addressing pain and swelling and recovery of gait is normally what people focus on. So getting the knee quiet, overcoming swelling, getting full range, of full knee extension, so at least zero degrees. So you can't you can't have good gait unless you've got zero degrees extension. Uh, so if you've got like a, a, a fixed flex uh, deformity or whatever, if you've got five de five degrees restriction, you can't walk properly because you need full extension to, to be able to walk. Um, so the, the first two is, yeah, pain and swelling. And the reason for that is because pain and swelling has a profound effect on joint proprioception, causes muscle inhibition, um, and pain is obviously a, a, an indicator that something's going wrong within the joint. Um, swelling also causes inhibition, so swelling will directly inhibit the quads 
through arthrogenic muscle inhibition. Um, but swelling also prevents full range of motion. So if you've got swelling in the joint, you can't recover quad extension, you can't get full knee flexion. So you can't get good range of motion unless you address pain and swelling. Um, yeah, and then recovery of range of motion, so lots of active and passive tasks to try and get the knee back to full extension and get at least kind of around 110, 120 degrees um, knee flexion. Um, in that, again, you need good knee flexion to have good gait. You can't get on a, on a cycle, a, bice, um, a stationary bicycle, unless you've got 110, 120 degrees of knee flexion. And the bike is a really good tool in the early stage to get that, that range of motion recovery and that fitness. Um, and then beyond that, it's kind of the, the third one for me is quadricep strength recovery or just general strength. Now, what happens in the early stage is a lot of people are very risk averse and this leads to a lot of muscle atrophy and the more muscle atrophy you're going to get at the quad the harder it's going to be to to get that recovery back in the mid stage so having a sufficient amount of work in the early stage to preserve that quadricep strength and preserve the muscle muscle size is really key um, there's a lot of techniques that you can do it you can't use a conventional strength and conditioning approach because the person's in pain they've got swelling um, and that's going to cause arthrogenic inhibition. So arthrogenic muscle inhibition means that you're trying to contract contract your quad. You're trying to do a knee extension type task. Um, you can't recruit all of those available motor units because there's some inhibition coming back from the joint. So the joint is sending some afferent um, input back to the spinal column that's preventing you from recruiting your quadricep muscle. So it basically means you can only recruit a certain amount of motor units. And if you can't recruit them, you can't provide a stimulus to be able to, to preserve them. Um, so that arthrogenic inhibition is why it's so challenging to do proper strength training in the early stage. Um, but it's not just that because you've got the joint that you need to protect as well. So if you do the wrong task, you can stretch that ACL. Um, so there's a lot of fear around open kinetic chain in the early stage, which is, I'll be honest, I don't really know. In that I've gone through, I've explored all the literature and I've still got some level of uncertainty. Um, I do think you need to do open kinetic chain, but I can see some of the surgeon perspective around um, protecting the, the graft and protect, particularly protecting what's called the incorporation sites where the, 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 um, the pins in essence have gone into the bone. So the actual, the actual tendon that's gone in is really strong. Um, so obviously you might be grafting with the patella tendon, uh, so quad tendon or bone patella tendon. The actual tendon is really strong, and that goes through a process where it converts to a ligament um, for a long period of time. But the tendon is really strong, but it's actually the the points where that's gone into the bone that's really weak. So you don't want to have a graft pull where the, the graft gets pulled out from the bone. Um, so there are some precautions in that early stage that mean that you can't just do lots of conventional strength training um, so that's why in, in the paper that we've just published I've got lots of recommendations on supplementary modalities so using things like neuromuscular electrical stimulation which is good because if you can't recruit the muscle voluntarily via the nervous system you can directly recruit it with electrical activity at the, the point of the muscle that helps overcome this the, the spinal inhibition that happens um, Blood flow restriction training is used a lot now. Um, where BFR is really good is that you can't do high load in the early stage because you've got to protect the joint, you've got inhibition, you just can't use high load. Um, so BFR is good because it allows you to get a lot of metabolic byproducts so you can fatigue the muscle. So you know, we do a lot of this in, in SNC, but there's a few different strategies of getting muscle hypertrophy. We know there's metabolic byproducts, there's mechanical tension, and there's excess, um, eccentric contractions. You can't go heavy load, so mechanical tension's off, and you can't really do eccentric high intensity. So you've got to go through metabolic adaptations. So it's all around trying to fatigue the muscle to get that, that improvement in hypertrophy. So BFR becomes really useful in the early stage. Um, and there's a couple just, of bits. Just to jump in, Matt. Yeah, yeah. Have you got any guidance on how or different pressures? Any guidance on BFR? There's I know there's loads out there now, even more yeah, and more. I'd probably lean on Stephen Patterson and Lee, uh, Luke Hughes's work on that. So definitely Stephen Patterson, who does have some guidance on it. Um, there's obviously a lot of different companies now, but um, yeah, Stephen Patterson has got some stuff out there. So there's a couple of recommendations in the paper. Um, there is a shift typically from, from passive BFR through to active BFR at different stages. And there is normally in the early stage, right at the beginning, it's normally passive BR, BFR plus neuromuscular stim. Uh, but then you start to go active 
active BFR from about three weeks onwards. So there's a tiny bit in the paper that we've wrote, but then Stephen does have additional resources that he's made recommendations around cuff pressures, cuff size, you know, exactly how to do it. So yeah, the, I would yeah read some of that stuff. And again, I can I can zip across a couple of papers if you if you want after if you want to highlight any. Anything. Perfect. He's done two yeah. bloody brilliant podcasts as well. Yeah. people can tap into so link them yeah, to exactly and it, um but yeah i'd say stephen's really the expert on the paper there um and yeah he's got a lot of good stuff out there equally luke hughes has got some good stuff but obviously i'm saint mary's biased there so there are other good people in the world doing some good stuff as well sorry i interrupted then carry yeah, on yeah, good. um and then yeah obviously yeah cross education's quite key now so i've kind of highlighted like this neural inhibition stuff we've got to overcome neural inhibition and you can do that through exercise but you can also use certain strategies to, to address it as well. So one of them you can use is like joint cooling at the start of the session. So the pain at the knee um, is causing inhibition. So what you can do is use joint cooling, so ice on the knee, before you do your quadriceps strength training. That then reduces the pain at the knee, desensitizes it, increases activation, and you get a better bang for your buck on your, your quadriceps strengthening as well. Um, there's a couple of other things like back tens, transcutaneous electrical nerve stim, um, and then cross education, which is probably where the S and C coaches will be more interested, is that you can do strength training on the other leg. What happens when we strength train is we get both morphological and neural adaptations. But by training our uninjured leg, we can get neural adaptations that then lead to improvements on the other side. So you can overcome that spinal and supraspinal inhibition and you can help re reduce that on the other side as well. And that means that you can facilitate increased strength on that leg. Um, but yeah, it's really just incorporating a load of strategies to overcome pain, swelling, overcome inhibition, and then safely load the quads to get a good stimulus. So it is, it's not easy. It is challenging. Um, and I can see why people do get worried and they tend to not then load the quad. But then that means that we get massive, massive muscle atrophy, massive strength deficits. And that's what leads to a really complex rehab process is that the further that quad strength comes down, the harder it gets. As soon as you start getting 60, 70 percent deficits, you get loads of pain at the knee. You can't get full extension and um, you can't walk properly and you just get stuck in around that phase. So that's for me, was probably the most important bit of the paper was how can we try to give some safe guidance on recovering quad strength for a little bit sooner so that people don't enter that that uh, valley of despair in essence where you're, you're kind of stuck. Um, and then, yeah, a couple more dimensions are don't just focus on the quad. There is also some hamstring stuff that you need to do. Um, particularly, probably one of the key bits from the paper from this is that a lot of people say don't load the hamstring six to eight weeks after ACL reconstruction when you've used the hamstring graft which just doesn't make sense because basically if you've got a if you're using a hamstring graft you've got an ACL reconstruction plus you've got a grade 4 hamstring tear now if you were to rehab someone with a with a hamstring reconstruction you wouldn't just leave them for 8 weeks and you so basically it's using your ACL protocol plus your hamstring um, severe tear protocol as well and it's just bringing that in making sure that you're getting some safe loading to the hamstring in the in the early stage so that you, again you just you don't get those issues um it's just logical but there's there's about two papers out there just saying leave it till it's eight weeks um and that's what everyone's tending to do um so that's probably a key part there and then if you're working with a pro you know include some stuff in around the calf so focus distally focus proximally address lumbar pelvic issues glute med um lumbar pelvic control stability um factors as well um and then Thought form is around movement quality restoration. Now, movement quality should be a running theme right the way throughout your, your ACL rehab, right from the beginning through to the end. Often what happens is people focus on movement quality at the end um, and then you don't have enough time. But there's a really good opportunity to, to train people's movement patterns right from the beginning in the pool. Um, and it should be a focal theme all the way through to return to play. And you've got maybe six to eight months there to really ingrain some good movement patterns. And movement training's challenging. And you need as long as possible to try and get those adaptations. Um, so yeah, that, the, the fourth dimension is just focus on movement quality, focus on good gait recovery, try and get a good symmetrical bilateral squat. So when you do start loading them, you've, you've addressed some of those movement impairments. And if you've got a bad squat at four weeks, that typically leads to long-standing squat impairments um, right the way through, even at 12 months, some research has shown. Um, and again, if you've got poor gait, 
mechanics that leads to poor running mechanics at four months so trying to address these things early helps us as we progress on um i'd say do a lot of that stuff in the pool early on if you've got access to a pool i know a lot of people don't have access to a pool um but the pool is basically like an anti-gravity room so you can stick someone in a swimming pool if you if you're doing exercise around chest height you've got about 60 percent reduction in body mass which means the reason you couldn't walk in the first place was because the quad was really weak. Weak. Now you put them in the pool. Now you can suddenly get good gait from people as well. So um, the only precaution there is if you've got a hamstring graft, don't start doing loads of really high intensity running um, in the pool because you will rupture the, the hamstring. Um, but yeah, kind of fourth dimension, focus on movement. The fifth one, thanks to more Ross Wadey, was around psych uh, psychological factors, but also social and environmental factors as well. So obviously there's a series of psychological factors we need to address quite early on. But the, the key bit for me in that paper was that there's a lot of social support structures that are available to people that they need help from. So when you have an ACL reconstruction, you're reliant on people. Your, your sense of independence goes. And so you need to do what's called that relationship mapping where you, you look at what's your potential social support structures and then trying to draw on that help from people. And, you know, and, and sometimes that might mean that you do your rehab at a different environment where you go back to where your family are. Um, and, and I think sometimes we need to think about is, is the team environment always the best environment? It, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, but just having social support around you is really, really important. Um, and yeah, and then finally, just physical fitness um, restoration. So making sure that we just do a little bit of, of conditioning work, particularly in our professionals. I wouldn't recommend this in recreational people because they haven't got the financial resources typically. Uh, but yeah, including a little bit of fitness preservation work in our professionals. So upper body strength work, um, upper body cardiovascular conditioning, nutrition control, just so they don't hit kind of 10, 12 weeks and they've put on you know a couple of stone and they've got deconditioned, just trying to preserve that a little bit. But importantly, with the physical fitness, that should never compromise the other dimensions. So the dimensions don't fit separately. They're all kind of interlinked and, and some of them help each other. So you can't recover range of motion unless you address pain and swelling. Um, physical fitness restoration uh, preservation should never compromise the joint um so it's 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 the secondary focus um never never cause pain swelling from physical fitness um sometimes people do get a little bit too focused on that too early so you've got to have your priority list which is get the knee straight get it nice and quiet get get them back walking and preserve that quad they you keep they key factors um cool yeah hopefully that's kind of an overview it's a pretty um it's a pretty big area and one thing i found with it is I learned loads working with the co-authors and there's a surgeon on there, sports docs and top class physios um, on there. And I learned a hell of a lot from those guys. And you realize how interdisciplinary that, that, um, that phase is, that stage is, it's much more medicalized than it is performance based. Um, so I, it should be certainly physio slash doctor slash surgeon led. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really complex area and I can see why people do struggle a little bit. So that's my main f thing with writing that paper was it's quite challenging. There's not a lot of guidance out there. So hopefully that will help give people a little bit of advice. Um, and there's, yeah, there's a lot of people on the paper that know a lot more about it than, than I do. So, um, yeah, hopefully that's useful. Perfect. So good. Do you, what well, would you mind just giving us a bit of an insight into the criteria that you use to transition athletes or, or patients from one phase to the next that i think that'd be really helpful and really yeah, yeah. insightful for the listener yeah definitely so yeah criterion based rehab for me is key um or having certain check boxes along the way that you're working to so it doesn't need to be at a particular stage it can just be that you've got certain criteria that you do want to hit the main reason for that is that you can't do certain tasks unless you have the prerequisites for it so for instance you can't walk on you can't have you can't get off the crutches unless you've got zero degrees knee extension. So there are certain tick boxes that you need to progress along. Um, obviously, the ACL pathway gets more and more intense as we go along, and there are certain times we do want to address key aspects. Um, so the early stage criteria that I've set is based on, and all of the criteria is based on kind of nice-to-haves and must-haves. Um, so there are certain must-have criteria. So early stage criteria, the must-have is low levels of pain, so it's zero to two, 
Um, low levels of swelling, so you can use like the, the sweet test, you need trace or zero um, swelling. Um, zero degrees extension, 110, 120 degrees knee flexion. Um, sufficient quadricep activation. So there's different ways of doing this, but the clinical way of doing it is a quad sag test, which is basically can you contract your quad, get your knee in full extension, and can you go into a, a straight leg race? And if your knee is if your knee is dropping into flexion, it means you can't sufficiently recruit your quad to maintain full extension. If you can't do that, you can't maintain full extension in walking because your quad is important to stabilize the knee, of course, when you're walking. So if you haven't got sufficient quadricep recruitment, you can't get sufficient walking pattern. And you don't want to load someone in the mid-stage if they've got inhibition because if you start loading them on an inhibition you're not going to get the desired results that you want you're then going to get patellofemoral pain and it's going to get a lot more complex so first address that inhibition issue and then when you do start loading them you'll get better returns off your strength work um, and then that's pretty much the early stage and then there are a couple of nice to haves so if you can do some quadricep strength testing that's great just to understand where they're at um, now, obviously, that's dependent on access to equipment. So some people might do some manual muscle testing. This whole area like needs exploring a bit more. But I'm a big fan of an isometric 90-degree um, um, knee extension on an isokinetic machine or just isometrically with a handheld dynamometer. The reason you do it at 90 degrees is because a lot of surgeons are worried about um, loading in the open kinetic chain. So ACL loading changes based on the angle. And so if you do knee extensions at zero degrees, um, so full extension or 10 degrees flexion, 20 degrees flexion, you get a lot more strain through the ACL. But if you do it in 90 degrees, you get 0% strain. So it's safe to do isometric 90 degree knee, flex, uh, knee extension um, just to get a measure of strength. Ideally, you get a limb symmetry index about 60%. So that's strength on the injured versus the uninjured leg, only a 40% deficit across limbs. Um, if it's much bigger than that, there's probably some problems around pain and swelling that you need to address. So there's no point doing heavier strength training. You're better off overcoming that inhibition and trying to get them to a point they can sufficiently recruit the quad. Um, and then, yeah, basically also maybe do a bilateral squat as well. Um, just look at the, the loading pattern. You should be ingraining a good bilateral squat pattern in the early stage, whether that's in the pool or in the gym. Um, Obviously, you want a good bilateral squat before you start loading. So doing your goblet squats, your overhead squats, your back squats, your conventional squat work, which should be a running theme through mid-stage. Um, but if you've got a bad bilateral squat going into it, that's because there's some um, there's some unloading and there's some fear of loading through that limb. So if you start loading that person in a, in a loaded back squat, then that's only going to get worse and you're going to create those, those movement pattern issues. I mean, then similar kind of theme at the mid stage and late stage. Mid stage, the principal criteria is quadricep strength at least 80% versus the other side. That's in an isokinetic, um, isokinetic test, but it's the same if you do um, handheld dynamometer. It's probably a little bit higher handheld dynamometer. But yeah, I'd say 80% limb symmetry index there. Um, you should be able to run on a treadmill with good running mechanics, you should have good hamstring strength. So again, 80% limb symmetry index. You should have good movement patterns. So if you can't do a good single leg squat and you can't do a good bilateral landing with good technique, when you start exposing them to more demanding tasks, the movement patterns are going to break down. The, the, the capacity is not going to be there. Um, and then some kind of closed chain strength as well. So are they strong enough to tolerate the ground reaction forces that you get when you do jumping landing tasks as well? Um, and then, yeah, late stage Similar, late stage is just, are they ready to go back to return to sport training? So probably the biggest thing for me on late stage rehab is that return to sport testing is not return to sport testing. For me, return to sport testing is late stage testing. It means now you're ready to go into a return to sport program, which should take three months. So when people pass return to sport testing, it's like, okay, yeah, now you're ready to do actual return to sport training. So your ability to hop doesn't mean you're ready to play sport. It just means that you've restored sufficient hop capacity. You can start to do now cutting cutting mechanics and change of direction. And you can go through that on-field rehab plan and gradually return back to play. And I think that's the bit that's really missing in a lot of ACL rehab is you have this three-month return to sport period, return to sport continuum, following return to sport testing. Return to sport testing is, is not clearance to go back and play. For me, it's clearance to commence return sport training. Um, 
and yeah, obviously I probably missed a couple of bits in there, but that's pretty much the general gist of criteria. Just um, a couple of things. It gives you it gives you objective data to know they're progressing well, but it also gives you objective data to hold people back because a lot of patients don't complete rehab programs. So gen the general public, the, the hardest thing is, can you just get them to the end? Um, you don't need the, the most the fanciest program in the world. You just need to keep them as long as possible. Too many of them go back too early. So if you've got some objective data there, then you can say, look, you're not quite ready. You, you need to do, you know, certain, even if they do it at home, whatever it is, but they shouldn't be going back to sport until they've hit those, those milestones. Um, but yeah, the, the more challenging bit is the, the literature that's out there is, is not amazing. And there's a lot of gaps in our knowledge base around what's the actual criteria you need to, you need to hit. So a lot of it's based on anecdotal experience and then some common sense, um, just around, you know, if someone's got a 10% deficit in their uninjured leg, sorry, in their injured leg versus their uninjured leg, then this person got injured when they were, you know, when they were stronger. So now, now they've got a, a weakened graft. So it takes about two years for the graft to get fully recovered. So now they've got a weakened graft. You shouldn't be sending them back with worse movement patterns, lower levels of strength, lower levels of conditioning, because they're at an even higher risk of getting re-injured. So if anything, you should be at 110%, not at, not at 90%. Would you mind just giving us a bit of de detail? That, that's great, Matt. It's really good and incredible amounts of detail for, for people to take on board there. For the return to sport testing, which then allows that, that three-month period to commence, the return to sport training, um, what does that testing look like? Then we'll get into the complex movements versus yeah, pre-planned yeah. stuff as, as well. Traditionally, what it looks like is a series of, of hot tests. So typically, um, the conventional hot tests are kind of single leg hop for distance, um, triple triple hops, and then you've got a six meter timed hop. And this is coming from the noise work and a lot of stuff from the inside of Macler, and a lot of good research out of the US. It is a clinically friendly tool in that if you've not got loads of kit and you've not got loads of time for testing, it is yeah, it does give you some good information. Um, but your ability to hop versus your uninjured side doesn't mean you're yeah, ready to go back and, and play sport because what started to become more aware now is we need to know can you cope with the demands of, of, of training and match play so can you cover 12k can you um can you do a certain amount of ax cells and d cells so it's not just doing one hop it's being able to tolerate the overall volume of multiple hops and change directions and d cells and so that's kind of where that bit's missing some people will do isokinetic testing or isometric testing with a handheld dynamometer to look at the quad strength, maybe the hamstring strength. Now, that should be pretty standard testing, but it's not. And I think there's some research out there showing that only one in four people get tested with like an isokinetic machine or a handheld dynamometer before they go back to play. Um, so that's your typical testing. And then it's normally a surgeon clearance or a doctor clearance. So what they're doing is looking at range of motion, stability, you know, have you got swelling, what's your, what's your quad... Um, your quad bulk, so they'll get you to do a you know a, a, a knee extension, so just a quad squeeze and look at your quad bulk. Um, so yeah, sports scientists would would be like, well, it's not hardly a good measure of muscle size, just looking at the way someone can activate their quad. Um, but yeah, it's normally like surgeon consensus typically. Um, hop testing and quadricep testing is pretty standard now. Psychological readiness is also becoming pretty common there is the psychological readiness questionnaire so it's called the acr return to sport index from kate webster there's a 12 question version a six question version that's quite useful to use to look at the readiness of the athletes um again really clinically friendly easy to use um, but that's the typical testing um also what should happen at late stages you should have a measure of movement quality so there's some excellent work coming out at Aspitar. They've shown that you know, when, we're, when we're hopping, we're looking for a horizontal distance. Um, the problem with that is it's compared to the uninjured leg, which means if you pass it, it's normally because the uninjured leg is not very good and you've not preserved that. And if you fail it, it's because, yeah, that leg's just not fully recovered. But horizontal hopping is more hip extension and, and calf than it is knee. So mostly what we're concerned with here is that it's normally the knee extensors that are the main problem. But if you do horizontal hopping, the overall contribution of the quads to hop distance is only about 25%, but the deceleration is about 60% quad or knee, knee extensor. So the, the main impact there is it's horizontal acceleration 
is less compromised by the knee, but deceleration is more compromised. So the great work coming out of Aspatar shown that you can have similar hop distance, but then when you land, you, you have like a knee avoidance strategy where you're offloading to the hip and the, into the calf. So I would say you need to be looking at deceleration kinematics, so the quality. Um, and if you're going to be looking at power, don't do a horizontal hop, do a vertical hop, because vertical hop, vertical jumping is more knee dominant um, than horizontal hopping. Um, but yeah, no, my recommendations for late stage testing is basically have you overcome muscle imbalances? So that should be the quad, the hamstring, but ideally also calf and then, you know, hip abduction, adduction, particularly if you're, you know, in a professional team setting, you've got access to, you know, valve sport products, for instance, the force frame, the um, Nordbar, um, uh, Nordic hamstring one, you've got the, you know, some, some force plates. There's a lot of testing you can do there. And that's standard testing for a lot of players. So that should also be standard testing for ACLs as well. But basically, have you overcome strength asymmetries? Have you overcome movement asymmetries? Are they physically fit enough to go back to return to sport training? Um, and then is the knee sufficiently sound? Normally what people look at is the knee sound and are they able to hop? Um, the movement testing, um, which we might come on to a little bit later anyway, more around the movement, but the movement testing should just be, can you move safely during a range of functional tasks um, in a pre-planned way? Because if you can't do it in a pre-planned way, when you go back to return to sport training, where there's contact, perturbation, um, decision-making, neurocognition, all this decision-making stuff, it's only going to get worse. So if you can't move in a pre-planned cut, you can't move in a, in a realistic cut. So it's just making sure they've restored those pre, pre-planned movement qualities. And then they're just ready to go back to return to sport training. Um, so again, on-field rehab. And then you, you're focusing on getting them progressively back to, back to the team as well. Um, but um, to summarise that, for me, late-stage testing should be very different to what it is conventionally. You should be looking at have they overcome muscle imbalances, at least um, at least 90% limb symmetry index in a quad and a hamstring, 90% limb symmetry index in closed chain, chain strength and power, um, good movement quality during single leg squat, jumping and cutting and deceleration tasks, um, and then yeah, sufficient physical fitness to start training as well. And if you tick off all of those boxes, then when they do go back to return to sport training, all the ingredients are there to progress, to progress nice and quickly as well. Perfect. Again, amazing detail. So thank you very much. Let's let's dive it into this into this pre-planned um, change direction and transition into a more chaotic environment. Do you have a, like a, a, a the key things in terms of movement quality that you're looking for during them pre-planned change of direction? that enable you to say, okay, I think this athlete is ready to go into a more chaotic environment. Yeah, yeah. So um, the first bit here is, yeah, task selection is pretty key. So I think the biggest issue for me around movement testing is the, the people are using the wrong tasks that don't reflect the sport in demand. So, you know, if you do like an FMS, which is a great tool, but there's no there's no landing really there. There's no there's no jumping. The the timing and the level of intensity of those efforts don't reflect that sport. So for me, I, I look at how do people get injured? What's the biomechanics and what's the situations in which they get injured? Um, our testing should to some degree reflect that. Um, so first off is just because you can do a good single leg squat doesn't mean you can do a good single leg landing, doesn't mean you can do a good single leg landing under realistic situations where there's contact, for instance. So I do like a single leg squat because it means is the foundation pattern there. But the foundation pattern, the single leg squat, it has the same pattern as a single leg decel or as a single leg landing. It looks identical. So if you use a 2D you know, camera, basically it's exactly the same. The main difference is the intensity, the, the time, do you have time for feedback? So is it feed forward motor processing or is it feedback motor processing? When you're doing a single leg squat, you've got time for feedback. When you do a single leg landing, it's too quick. You don't have time for feedback because that whole reaction time is about 250 milliseconds. So um, for me there is just what's the task selection? So the task should reflect the intensity um, the ground contact times, it should reflect stretch shortening cycle nature of, of movements. Um, and, and it should... Um, yeah, basically reflect those biomechanical demands of how people get injured. So in terms of the testing, I like to use a single leg squat, a single leg landing, um, a bilateral jump, a unilateral jump, 
and then I could change the direction as well. Um, and the reason what we'd be looking for then is can you just do those tasks with good technique and are there ma not major con uh, compensations? So the big compensations you see after a knee injury, is there a knee avoidance strategy? And that just means that they can't effectively load through the knee, so they compensate at the hip um, to, to offload that. So in the sagittal plane, if you land with three times body mass, there's a certain amount of load that has to be absorbed by the knee, ankle, and hip in the sagittal plane. Um, if the, the knee extensor has an avoidance strategy, it will offload to the hip. So the hip will take, say, 60%. The knee will only take 20%. Um, so what you do there is it's just can you move with good good kinematics during a range of functional tasks. Um, if you can, the necessary biomechanics is there. So you've probably got sufficient strength, you've got sufficient patterning to be able to move in that way. And then after that, you're more concerned with what happens under realistic contexts. Um, in that, can you process that information during a sports task really well? But yeah, what, what we really look for is good control in the frontal and sagittal plane during a range of different tasks. Um, the reason I say range of different tasks is because it allows you to look at what's the problem. So if you've got a good single leg squat, but a bad single leg landing, it's probably not the foundation pattern. It's probably not joint range of motion or probably even um, strength symmetries to some degree. It's probably more like eccentric strength. It's probably like a timing problem um, in that the main difference is that the timing is a lot faster. Um, you've got a lot of rate of absorption. So the main difference there is you've got a good pattern, you just can't you can't handle that pattern under high load. So that's why I like a range of tasks to look at what's the what's the problem. Superb. Superb. So we'll get to this this more chaotic environment. We've we've established the pre planned stuff is acceptable and we think everything's safe, movement quality is good. We've looked at all the different uh, assessments that you've just mentioned there. Where do we start in terms of introducing that chaotic nature of a, of a task that, again, is, yes, pushing the athlete or the patient forward into that environment, but also doing that safely? And what, what would be your kind of step one? Um, so first bit there would be, yeah, at this point, based on yeah, kind of my on-field rehab plan and that of Matt Taberners, which are pretty similar. So you've kind of got five stages. So far where we should be at, is we should have done the first two stages. So for me, late stage rehab is is the first two periods of on-field rehab. It's all much more controlled. It's much more pre-planned. So you can do that alongside the stuff you're doing in the clinic as well. But by now, yeah, you can do a good change of direction under pre-planned scenarios. But what we need to do now is recognise that just because you can move well under that context doesn't mean you won't move. You can't do it well in sports-specific contexts. And the main things there that I consider are. Um, cognitive loading so the kind of level of cognitive loading and this is all based on our attentional capacity so we've got a certain amount of attentional capacity that we have we devote a certain amount of that attentional capacity to movement and then we devote a certain amount of attentional capacity to our environment um, but during pre-planned tasks the environment is really simple you just ask them to run forward and cut a cone or a force plate so the, the, the attentional demands for the environment is really small which means our attentional capacity our limit is not going to be overwhelmed. But once you start overwhelming someone's attentional capacity, the amount of effort that they can put towards doing the cut, that gets reduced. So the problem here is just that you can move well under one context, that's because you're not challenging their neurocognition. So what you've got to start to do is just to gradually make the environment more and more complex, start to adding in more decision-making, more thought processing. And what that's doing is it's challenging that spare space. So an element of it is, is neurocognition, thought processing, decision making. Can you start to make that more and more complex? So what I would do there is um, obviously start to add in something in the environment. So it could just be change of direction, get them looking in the environment where holding up different color cones. So rather than run towards the cone and cut left or cut right, um, you've got reactive, of course, so pre-planned versus reactive. So you start to add in a reactive stimulus there. So rather than saying you know, run forward and cut the cone, run forward to the cone. And when I put my hand up or cone up, I want you to cut that point. So it's just, yeah, reactive. And what we know is that reactive change directions make us move worse than pre-planned. So there's always this drop off and there's a bigger drop off in ACL patients than there is in um, normal patients. And that's because the level of attention they have to give to the movements a lot more. So there's a bigger drop off in their, their performance. Um, 
so I just have loads of those different levels with um, like complexity. So rather than run forward and cut a cone, I might give them three or four choices. So the cone, the left or right, simple. So I might say, okay, I want you to cut left or right, or I want you to do a 180 turn, or I want you to do a 45 degree cut. But you might give them five or six different decisions to, to make that more thought provoking. Um, or you might give them different color cones. So I want you to run forward. If I put the cone up, I want you to cut left. If I shout left, I want you to cut right. And just give them lots of different bits around that just to get them thinking a bit more. Um, and then you try and throw them into things like tag, where they've got to, you know, all you've got to do is run for a little tag game like we used to do at school, all the great games. Um, but there, what they've got to do is they're running towards you. They've got to now look in the environment, got to look where you are. They've got to make a decision. They've got to know when to accelerate, decelerate. So you're just making that more and more complex in terms of the decision making. Um, alongside that stuff, I would also add in um, contact-based work as well. So pre-planned movements with contact. So 25% of ACL injuries involve, sorry, 44% of ACL injuries involve um, some kind of non-contact, uh, indirect contact mechanism, so a push or a shove, typically to the upper body. So now start to get them to do pre-planned movements, but with a bit of contact as well. So that could be using ropes, using Swiss balls, just pushing them, a little bit of contact to get them to maintain that um, overall control. Um, I'd also add in the technical base drills as well, but again, this is separate. So what I'm trying to do there is, is look at all the different components, but treat them separately. So neurocognition and decision-making, decision contact, fatigue, and um, technical-based gestures. I layer all of those up separately. So the technical-based skills are first pre-planned. Their, um, their fatigue stuff is during pre-planned scenarios. So try and fatigue them under cutting um, and try and give them mechanical perturbation under pre-planned movements. And then you just start to add them all together. So can you now do a technical-based gesture with two or three decisions? And then start to add both of those up, make the technical gesture a little bit more complex, add in the number of decisions. You're just trying to layer everything up progressively until you get back to get back to sport. And it's just seeing each of the dimensions as a, as a component that you've got to layer up. Now, there's no set way of doing that because... You look at all of those different things, there's an infinite number of ways of doing it. There's no perfect way. Um, but it's just recognising how can I just safely get them back to sport and just adding in all these different areas. I don't know if that makes sense. or Makes absolute sense. And again, incredible detail. Is there anything that you would do to kind of pass them off to go into training? Or is that very much a subjective thing? Or is there yeah, a it's, checklist? How would you approach yeah, it that? Depends. So obviously different teams have their different ways of doing it. Um, now, it partly depends on what's the philosophy of the club. So are they allowing a player to come in and to modify training or do they need to enter full training? Um, so I have different scenarios for me working in private practices. Some clubs would say, okay, well, you're handling that player. When they come back, they better be ready for full training because we're not, we're not touching their rehab. Um, because they just don't want to be involved in that. Because you know, sometimes a player goes privately, it, it can create um, yeah, political storms. So um, they might say, prepare that player for full training, or even prepare that player for matches, which I've had before. Um, and it might also be that you're handing that player back, and you know that the medical team, you know, it's, you know, it's not a top medical team in the UK, there might be a, a medical team abroad that hasn't got the same staffing resources and knowledge. Um, and you might be thinking, OK, well, I'm sending this player back with some advice um, and they can get played quite quickly. And I've had that before, sending a player back to a, um, a country abroad and they played him the first week back. They actually played that player twice within a week, um, full games. And so you're kind of like, what are you preparing them for? Where is where's the border? Um, Did he survive, Matt? Sorry? Did he survive? Um, yeah, no, it? Yeah, yeah, no, it was good. Yeah, um, obviously there, I got to. Um, we kind of over prepared him on that basis, knowing he probably wouldn't have done if you'd have sent him back saying, "Oh, he's ready for modified training." You send him back and he's ready for modified training. He probably would. There'd be an issue. Um, so you're just trying to, yeah. Where, what are you preparing him for? Ideally, you've got really good close communication, and you know exactly what you're preparing him for. And I've had some 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 ACL injuries from some very good medical departments in the UK, where their staff members have come across, they've looked at where they're at, and you have a really good handover. Um, you know that you're preparing that player for modified training at, at most, or they might even take that final period. They might say, okay, we want to do a week or two with him here. 
because ultimately once you hand him back, it's the club's responsibility. So you know they might go, you know what, we're not going to throw him straight back into training. We'll do a little bit of work just as a as a safeguarding approach for ourselves. Um, so there's no like you have to do this. It's very much based on the the context in which you're preparing them for. Um, but for me to go back into full training, they must have sufficient workload. So they must have, you know, at least a chronic workload of 70%, um, which is a bit theoretical because we don't actually know what it is. There's very little research. We're doing a tiny bit at the moment around that. But um, again, it doesn't matter if it's 70% because all you do to say to the team is, okay, the person's at this chronic workload. Okay. Like, you know that you can't push them too hard. So if you've got good communication channels, they're not going to go and smash that player um, and, and do too much. So, But make sure they've got sufficient workload. They've done every single task. They're able to do 1v1s. They're able to do at least sort of 2v1, 2v2 scenarios. Um, if they can do that, they can probably go back into team training um, on the proviso that they don't go back into um, match play in, in terms of like team training match play. Um, but yeah, they should have done every single task as part of the on-field plan. They should have passed return to sport training, uh, testing to go into the on-field plan. They should have good workload. Um, and then that's pretty much it. At the moment, the bit I'm interested in is once you finish that, that on-field period, there's not a great amount of on-field testing that happens. Um, in terms of there's no real tests there that we do and go, right, you're safe to go in, back into training. It's kind of like you do your on-field plan, you might do some physical fitness testing. So what's their speed? What's their strength? What's their power? You do your normal needs analysis, your normal profiling stuff. Um, but there's no like real on-field test at the moment that's kind of a clearance test. And that's something I'm interested in and like to do some more research in is, is that like, can we can we run our players through like a match simulation test and know that they're, they're safe and that they can move well under realistic scenarios? Because we're still a little bit dependent on that movement test that they're moving safe. We don't know that now they can move well when they're fatigued um you can use cameras on the pitch and, and expose them to it but um yeah there's still a little bit of guesswork but ultimately you should just be gradually making those demands harder and harder ideally return them back to modified training back to full training then full training plus top-ups then you're just preparing them back into into match play and then the team then will be responsible but normally most teams are going you know full training full training plus individual work um return back to lower level so development team, reserve team, play 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes, and gradually increase those match minutes. Um, but teams have been doing that for years, at least in the UK. Um, actually, surprisingly, because I did some, I chatted to some good people in the UK, and I, I did a paper in BGSM around the, the frameworks and the return to sport continuum. And I felt, based on my working with people in Europe, that and other countries are far that it was quite interesting. But people in the UK were like, Matt, we've been doing this for years. Like, this is standard stuff. But then there's a lot of people not doing that. So they don't have processes where they're going from training to match play. Some coaches in certain countries think once they're ready to train, they're ready to play. They don't see a difference between training and match play. So it's just knowing what you're sending them back to, um, what's the medical team you're sending them back to as well. Of course. Right, mate, I've kept you for nearly an hour. And I'll say it, I've said it a million times already, and I'll say it again, incredible amounts of detail in that, taking us through the whole, pretty much the whole journey. So thank you very much for that. If there's anyone out there that wants to get hold of the latest paper or anything else you've done previous, what's the best place? Um, so obviously bits of my stuff on Twitter, I always put the papers on Twitter. Um, so it's just, yeah, kind of um, M underscore is it the little dash underneath uh, book for um for the twitter handle most of it will be on research gates so you can go on research gate research gates a good one if you can't get access to papers and they are behind a paywall um a lot of people will have their papers on research gate um a lot of my stuff's open access as well so you can just type the papers in and it, it will be on there uh, but research gates a good one because it has the list of papers for all of those for that author and you can just go in a lot of them are available as well um but yeah probably my twitter i make sure the papers are on there um and then yeah just stick into google but also reach out via email um so yeah we're generally happy to send work what we can't do is say oh here's a pdf we'll put it up on put up on on um, linkedin or whatever because we're not allowed to do that uh, but you can go through research gate and do that or just send us emails and you know anyone emails me i'll happily send them 
whatever papers they, whatever they need. A lot of my stuff's translational research, so I wrote it to try and help like translate stuff into practice. So the worst thing for me is if no one reads it, otherwise what's the point? What's the point writing it? So yeah, no, happy to share that. Um, my email, happy to share that. That's mbookfor.hotmail.com. Um, if anyone wants to email me on that, I am yeah very happy to send some work out to them as well. Top man. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. Look forward to keeping in touch and seeing what else comes out. And um, yeah, thanks again. We'll speak soon. Cheers, Rob. Thanks a lot for that, mate. Cheers, Matt. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Cheers.